Good morning, everyone. It is 10.10 a.m. on Sunday, April 14th, 2019. So today I have decided that I'm going to be reading Unrestricted Warfare, which is a text written in Beijing on behalf of uh, the People's Liberation Army by one Qiao Yang and Wang Xiang Sui. However, before we get to that, I want to preface it by reading a related paper by the Canadian Forces College, pardon me, by a student at the Canadian Forces College, which is basically the Canadian Army's war college, so to speak. So basically here we have the title of that. Unrestricted warfare in Chinese and Iranian foreign policies. Is the Phoenix walking into the Red Dragon's footsteps? by Lieutenant Colonel M. R. Peralt. Now, the uh, disclaimer section here is bilingual in French and English. I'm only going to re read the uh, English version, as my French is atrocious, to be frank. So, um, article number JCSP42, Exercise Solo Flight. Disclaimer. Opinions expressed remain those of the author and do not represent Department of National Defense or Canadian Forces policy. This paper may not be used without written permission. Uh, copyright C, Her Majesty the Queen in Right of Canada, as represented by the Minister of National Defense, circa 2016. Canadian Forces War College, uh, JCSP 42, uh, 2015 to 2016. Exercise Solo Flight, titled Unrestricted Warfare in Chinese and Iranian Foreign Policies, is the Phoenix Walking into the Red Dragon's Footsteps, by Lieutenant Colonel M. R. Peralt. This paper was written by a student attending the Canadian Forces College in fulfillment of one of the requirements of the course of studies. The paper is a scholastic document and thus contains facts and opinions which the author alone considered appropriate and correct for the subject. It does not necessarily reflect the policy or the opinion of any agency, including the Government of Canada and the Canadian Department of National Defense. This paper may not be released, quoted, or copied, except with the express permission of the Canadian Department of National Defense. Uh, word count, 5,454 words. Page 1. As the international community welcomed the Iranian nuclear deal and its implementation, the eyes of the world turned to the Persian Gulf region with hopes about how relations with the enigmatic, the enigmatic Islamic Republic would unfurl. The P51, uh, sorry, the P5 plus one benefited from the positive political fallout. Markets reacted favorably to the deal's implementation, and businesses around the world are eager to develop new business opportunities. With Iranians rejoicing at the end of sanctions, President Rouhani, or Rouhani, I'm butchering that name, pardon me, sailed to successful elections as he continues to engage the international community and reform Iranian economic policies. Iran continues to position itself on the international chessboard. Interesting to note here, breaking from the text for a moment, that that policy, namely the Iranian nuclear deal, was um, rendered defunct by President Trump some months ago, if memory serves. Anyway, continuing here. Meanwhile, China is also implementing its own chess strategy. The Red Dragon engages international organizations and economic markets, reaches out to the world using its soft power, while making territorial claims in the South China Sea and expanding its military presence beyond its region via the establishment of a naval base in Djibouti. No similarities readily stand out between the Islamic Republic of Iran and the People's Republic of China. The former is an important oil producer, turning the page on several sanctions, in brackets here, but not all of them, while the latter is the world's factory as it continues its extraordinary economic progress. 
digging further into how China got to where it is today and where Iran seems to be headed, clouds dissipate and offer a different view as they seem to follow a common logical thread in how they interact with the outside world and how they use various means to reach their foreign policy objectives. With this in mind, we can ask ourselves why? Why does the Iranian foreign policy seem to be following the same logic as the Chinese one? And to which extent will it be called to follow the same development pattern? Using the concept of unrestricted warfare as a theory backdrop outlined in a book bearing the same name by Colonel Xiao Liang and Colonel Wang Xiang Sui, both from the People's Liberation Army, or PLA. This essay will demonstrate that the Iranian foreign policy follows the same logic as the Chinese foreign policy because it is affected by similar factors, which in turn explain its use of the unrestricted warfare concept. The first part will consist of an overview of unrestricted warfare concepts main principles to establish a firm basis of analysis. The second part will be developed, pardon me, will be devolved to the genesis of the Chinese foreign policy to determine the historical elements and cultural determinants that led to what is today against which the Iranian foreign policy will be compared. This will be done by considering the evolution of both foreign policies through three lenses. How they see themselves, how they see the world, and how to act against them. Following this, similarities between the two shall be presented. Leaning on these findings, a prospective analysis of the Iranian model against the concept of unrestricted warfare will be performed. Unrestricted Warfare. The concept of total war outlined in the book Unrestricted Warfare will be referred to as such throughout this essay. It outlines that the conduct of war is no longer exclusively limited to the use of force to compel an enemy to one's will, but rather through one's use of military and non-military means in various domains to get an enemy to comply with its interests. Citation, Liang Qiao and Xiang Sui Wang, Unrestricted Warfare, China's Master Plan to Destroy America. Um, publishment, publishing house, Panama City, Panama, Pan American Publishing, 2002, page uh, XXII, which would be page 22, if I'm not mistaken. It is important to note that the People's Liberation Army published the book and that since the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, praised it, the content is likely not that quote-unquote out of step with official thinking, end quote, for which we have the citation Jeffrey W. Bolander, The Dragon's New Claws, Volume 85, Quantico Marine Corps Association, 2001, page 59. It is therefore considered as Chinese doctrine for the purposes of this essay. Principles of Unrestricted Warfare Colonels Liang and Shang Sui outline six essential principles in unrestricted warfare, namely, omnidirectionality, synchronicity, limited objective, asymmetry, minimal consumption, and multidimensional coordination. Citation, Qiao and Wang, Unrestricted Warfare, China's Master Plan to Destroy America, page 177. Returning now to the text. Omnidirectionality calls for the combined use of all factors involved in a war and to keep an eye out for anything and anyone that could contribute to the attainment of objective at all levels, maintaining a 360 degree field of vision to remain aware of any changes to the current situation and of any available resources available. Citation, Ibid, page 177, which means this too comes from Qiao and Wang, Unrestricted Warfare, China's Master Plan to Destroy America. Again, to the, back to the text. 
<sighs> With the evolution of military technologies, actions can be taken in ways allowing simultaneous accomplishment of tasks, yielding simultaneous outcomes. Contrary to what its name may seem to indicate, synchrony is not about simultaneous action at a very specific timing, but rather calls for action, quote-unquote, within the same time period. Citation, Ibid, page 178. It means using all elements considered under omnidirectionality to apply them during a specific time window at the instigator's liking. The selection of objectives becomes important in this concept. Through limited objectives, it underlines the importance of choosing objectives that will actually be feasible, within reach and abilities. Citation, Ibid, page 179. In essence, it is better to select objectives at all levels within one's reach and to build on small successes over time rather than being the frog wishing to be the ox. With this in mind, a minimal consumption of resources favors a rational use of these resources which is not to be mistaken with an economy of resources since the latter concept is useless if the objective is not reached, whereas the former seeks to use the right amount of resources to be successful. Citation, Ibid, page 183. With the proper resources and objectives selected, Unrestricted warfare also calls to avoid directly facing a stronger opponent. With asymmetry, the idea is to find the opponent's weaknesses and exploit them in the least expected way. Citation, Ibid, page 183. It then leaves an opponent using conventional forces and measures to, quote, look like an elephant in a china shop, unable to make use of the power it has. It says chin shop here, I don't know what that is. Either way, same as previous, Ibid, page 189. The multidimensional coordination will ensure the proper coordination and cooperation of the resources in place to accomplish a specific objective. Citation, Ibid, page 183. Such action can be taken using various combinations. Next here, combinations. One premise of unrestricted warfare is that we must think beyond the conventional battle space as we know it. For the quote unquote struggle for victory will take place on a battlefield beyond the battlefield, end quote, for which we have the citation Ibid, page 153. In addition, it views limits and boundaries as being something we impose upon ourselves and advocates for exceeding them through transcending ideology and thinking outside the box, selecting the best means to reach the objectives. It does not mean to imply the extreme means must always be selected in all places, but rather that there is always a means to which we can break through those limits. Again, citation, Ibid, page 154. Unrestricted warfare also calls for those wanting to win tomorrow's conflict to, quote, combine all the resources of war which they have at their disposal and use them as means to prosecute war. Citation, Ibid, page 155. It also underlines that using means by themselves is not sufficient to reach victory and requires combining them. The result is a wholesome concept, quote, modified combined war that goes beyond limits. Citation, Ibid, page 155, yet again. Four combinations are born from this. One, supranational combinations. Two, supra-domain combinations, three, supra-means combinations, and four, supra-tier combinations. Next heading here, 
supranational combinations. States are closely linked through economic markets and integrated networks of information and ideas. Meanwhile, non-state actors are posing a threat to states accustomed to fight conventional wars and adversaries. They should say fighting conventional wars and adversaries here. Some minor little grammatical errors. With this, countries start realizing they can't face such diverse threats in isolation because of the means available to them, but also because multilateralism is preferred by the international community. Acting in isolation can erode one's legitimacy of action as sometimes demonstrated by Washington in the accomplishment of its objectives. Hence the necessity to ask and even rely upon the help of other states and organizations to support reaching national objectives. Unrestricted warfare finds the resolution of conflict and the conduct of warfare can't be done solely with national power. Citation Ibid, page 159. As pure conventional military strength will no longer be the sole element to decide the victor between two states, the use of supranational means will help the victor to achieve its objectives on the stage larger that, sorry, on a stage larger that he size, that doesn't make any sense, on a stage larger that he size of a country. Citation, Ibid, page 156, and that must have a typo in there, surely, because I can't make heads or tails of that. Therefore, a state will be able to use its own power, combined with the one of supranational, transitional, and non-state actors, and through their and through such combinations, be able to accomplish national security objectives and strategic security interests. Citation, Ibid, page 159. Next heading here. Supra-domain combinations. The combination of domains supposes the combination of battlefields in a manner outlined and related to all or some of the principles outlined above, depending on the situation, since each of those could become where the conflict is waged. Domains like politics, religion, economics, culture, diplomacy, and military affairs are becoming intertwined. Citation, Ibid, page 161, and have opened the door to new kinds of warfare to be waged on a global level. This is showing that the conduct of warfare is no longer restricted to the military arena in a world where emergent technologies can even enable virtual domains to become a battlefield, sometimes at a fraction of the cost to the two national power resources. As such, supra-domain combinations are about considering and selecting which domain, i.e. battlefields, will be the best for a state to reach its objectives. Citation Ibid, page 163. Supra-mean combinations. These combinations must be viewed in association with supra-domain and supra-national combinations. Means can present themselves as such, but also as objectives, depending on which domain and level of operation we see them, and have a reach across levels and domains. Citation IBID. Not specified page number, but simply IBID. Most of these are gathered from the text that is being examined. Just as a prism reveals colors composing light, a different angle of vision shall reveal a different color. It also shows that means, even if used in various domains, can be linked together to multiply a desired effect. For example, a state may use information means in the military domain through an information operation campaign to achieve strategic and tactical effects while also using it in the diplomacy domain to support military objectives.
in an increasingly complicated world environment with fluid situations and issues, the flexibility and multiplied power provided by supra means com combinations signifies that a means used by itself will not have greater effect that a combination, they should say, than that of a combination of the same. Slight uh, typo there. Uh, citation IBID page 166. Supra tier combinations. Instead of adopting a, sequ a sequential approach to warfare, whereas an objective needs to be accomplished before getting to the next one, these combinations allow for simultaneous completion of actions to various levels to break down, quote, all the stages and link up and assemble these stages at will. Citation, IBID, page 169. Building on the three previous combinations, this provides the state the initiative of time and freedom to combine effects at different stages, breaking down the boundaries and limits imposed by processes. Despite critics by some of... They say despite critics, but they should say here despite criticism... Despite criticism by some that the inspiration of the concept comes from, quote, Western futurists, U.S. military theorists, and U.S. Department of Defense, DOD documents, citation, uh, Van Messel, Major John A., um, Unrestricted Warfare, A Chinese Doctrine for Future Warfare, Masters of Operational Studies, United States Marine Corps, School of Advanced Warfighting, Marine Corps University, 2005, page 2. So evidently that's um, a strategic theory document published at the U.S. Um, Army's Marine Corps University. Anyway, continuing from the top of that paragraph. Despite critics... Despite criticism by some that the inspiration of the concept comes from Western futurists, U.S. military theorists, and U.S. Department of Defense DOD documents, Unrestricted Warfare does outline age-old concepts which point to possible alternatives while providing a, quote, broad perspective on the implications of combining tactics and technologies in the new era of globalism for which we have here citation IBID, page 9. Next heading here. Genesis of the Chinese foreign policy. How they see themselves. The last century has left a deep mark on Chinese society. With the, quote, hundred years of shame and humiliation, citation um, Evan S. Uh, Medieros, Project Air Force USA, and RAND Corporation, China's International Behavior, Activism, Opportunism, and Diversification, Volume MG850, Santa Monica, California, um, RAND, I think that means Ayn Rand Institute, but I'm not sure, RAND 2009, page 10. Anyway, taking up where we were a moment ago, um, here we are, yes. The last century has left a deep mark on Chinese society. With the hundred years of shame and humiliation, it lived through invasions and attempts by the United States and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics to deny development of nuclear weapons and unification with Taiwan. A narrative emerged whereas the Chinese viewed themselves as a weakened nation, victims of years of foreign intervention and abuse and wary of any outside threats to national integrity. However, it has recently evolved to a great power mentality focusing on China's outcomes in the economic field and its rising global status. Citation IBID, page 11. The victim narrative remains as a soft power tool to shape public opinion and for use in diplomatic relations. Citation Abid, page 11. The Middle Kingdom's status narrative also relies on history, but calls upon China's past regional importance as having a, quote, supreme role in the region. Citation Sean Bresland, Handbook of China's International Relations, New York, Rutledge, 2010, page 51. 
It builds on the changing perception linked with the great power mentality and links with the changing victim narrative seeking, quote, inter in international respect as a great power, which is a major feature of contemporary Chinese national identity. Citation, Ibid, page 51. By recalling the past, they remember where they don't want to find themselves yet again. And by adopting a more positive discourse, they set the groundwork for what they want to become. New heading. How they see the world. China's self-perception influences its views on the world. Building on the victim narrative Mao used on the victim narrative, Mao used it to support suspicion towards foreign countries' intentions as being, quote, driven by ulterior or even evil intentions. Citation Ibid, page 48. This has supported beliefs about foreign powers wanting to constrain China's rise while getting it into a crisis to exploit its vulnerabilities. Citation, Medieros Project Air Force, United States of America, and RAND Corporation, China's International Behavior, Activism, Opportunism, and Diversification, page 11. Continuing now. China also keeps a close eye on the international order, preferring polarity. It opines the world is moving towards a multipolarity and attempts to determine exactly which countries could become a quote-unquote pole. Citation Henry R. Now and Deepa Mary Ol Apali, Worldviews of Aspiring Powers, Domestic Foreign Policy Debates in China, India, Iran, Japan, and Russia, Oxford, Oxford University Press, 2012, page 42. All right, then. While keeping an eye on the American unipolarity, Chinese leadership wonders why U.S. power has not declined in favor of China, admitting that they, quote, consistently underestimate the United States. Citation Ibid, page 43. They, however, believe that conditions are now in place for the balance of global order to lean towards multipolarity once again. Another perspective of Beijing's worldview links to multilateralism, seen first and foremost as a tool and a tactic, quote, not an intergovernmental mechanism of institutional arrangement. Citation here, Ibid, page 45. Going from the Maoist view that everybody is out there to get China, Deng's reform of the foreign policy corrected the Chinese leadership's sight. As the country's global interests grew, Beijing saw an advantage to engage with diverse organizations to, quote, gain more goods and information from the international system. Citation Mark Lantiegni, uh, Chinese Foreign Policy, an Introduction, published mi House, uh, Milton Park, Ombigden, Oxen, Rutledge, 2013, page 60. Finally, China views its security environment in six elements. No major power war, globalization, the global power balance, non-traditional security challenges, energy insecurity, and its own rise. Citation, Medieros Project Air Force United States and Rand Corporation, China's International Behavior, Activism, Opportunism, and Diversification, page XVII, so that would be 25 plus 2, 27, page 27. Uh, where was I here? Ah, here we go. While Beijing does not foresee a major conflict in the medium term, it has realized the benefits and obligations of globalization. Furthermore, it sees multipolarity as gaining speed and is discovering emerging threats which will call for new methods to confront them. Finally, with a status of net oil and gas importer, the safe transit of such resources carries an inherent security component. How to act. Medeiros sees Beijing's foreign policy being guided by five objectives. First, foster economic development. 
then develop and implement reassurance measures, counter constraints, diversify its access to natural resources, and a reduction of the international space used by Taiwan. Citation, Ibid, page 45. First, China determined it had to use diplomacy to minimize potential global threats, which would necessitate a reallocation of resources away from the economic sector, while also using it to foster political contacts, which bring access to trade, foreign aid, investment opportunities, technologies, and resources. Citation, Ibid, page 51. Second, as China's economic and military capabilities grew, its neighbors became anxious. That was addressed with a, quote, great, peripheral, uh, great peripheral diplomacy, end quote, aimed at presenting China as a reasonable and responsible major power involved in multilateral organizations of the region. Citation, Ibid, page 52. Beijing coined the expression peaceful rise to address these anxieties. At the same time, it is not looking to confront any of its neighbors since it would disrupt its growth while reducing the Chinese Communist Party's hold on power. Citation, China Rising, How the Asian Colossus is Changing Our World. Carnegie Endowment for International Peace accessed April 11th, 2016, and they have here a fairly lengthy URL link, which I am not going to bother reading, but will mention in photo format on the page, and also they list here page 47 of that document, or it looks two separate PDF documents here, if I'm not mistaken. Either way, continuing with the text, uh, from the top of that paragraph, may as well. Second, as China's economic and military capabilities grew, its neighbors became anxious. That was addressed with a great peripheral diplomacy aimed at presenting China as a responsible major power involved in multilateral organizations of the region. Beijing coined the expression peaceful rise to address these anxieties. At the same time, it is not looking to confront any of its neighbors since such would disrupt its growth while reducing the Chinese Communist Party's grip on power, a pragmatic approach to issues solving being preferred to reduce tensions. Third, they wish to prevent other nations from limiting their ambitions. However, a balance must be maintained. While on the one hand, Beijing needs to negate the capacity and capability of other nations to affect its rise, on the other hand, it must not cross a line that would turn them against it. Citation, Medeiros Project Air Force United States and RAND Corporation, China's International Behavior, Activism, Opportunism, and Diversification, page 57. By placing importance on the sanctity of the state, China shows its preference for a Westphalian order. Citation, Lang Tang Ni, Chinese Foreign Policy, an introduction, page 23. Fourth, China needs to protect its growth through unimpeded access to natural resources. Doing so requires the use of its diplomacy to create new and expanding existing relationships, thus providing alternative providers of resources and alternate supply routes, while also preventing foreign interdiction in their sphere of influence. Citation, Medeiros Project Air Force US and RAND Corporation, China's International Behavior, Activism, Opportunism, and Diversification, pages 58 and 59. Finally, with a view to reunify Taiwan with China, Beijing looks at ensuring that other countries do not seek to support Taiwan's independence. Citation, Ibid, page 59. Despite the efforts to ensure a continuous growth free of conflict with neighbors and claims about not wanting to be a regional hegemon, John Mersheimer presents a critical view. 
According to him, a scenario where China rises peacefully is not feasible, since if it continues to grow as it does, Beijing and Washington will be, quote, likely to engage in an intense security competition with considerable potential for war. Citation, Spence et al., China Rising, How the Asian Colossus is Changing Our World, page 47. New uh, heading here. Chinese Strategic Culture and Unrestricted Warfare. The Chinese strategic culture is an ambiguous one. On the one hand, China prefers a pacifist approach using, for example, soft power and diplomacy to other instruments available to the state to deal with issues. Its involvement in regional and international organizations being a manifestation of this approach. Citation, Valérie Niquet, Culture Stratégique et Politique de Défense en Chine, uh, Maison de la Chine, Paris, Institut Français de Relations Internationales, September 26th through 28th, 2007 and 2008, page 8. So if you hadn't noticed, that citation there is very clearly in French and loosely translated, uh, Cultural Strategy and Politics of the Chinese Defense Forces, uh, published by the Something Institute of in France, uh, the, the, Insti the Institute of Chinese Studies, Paris, France, and for, uh, for uh, Foreign in and International Relations. That's basically what that translates to, more or less. Anyway, yeah, published September 26th through 28th on 2007 and 2008. I guess there was like probably uh, an annual meeting over those days on 2007, 2008, during which the text itself was written up. I'm not sure for, uh, I can't say for certain. Either way, returning to the text itself now, um, I'll just take it from the top. Uh, Chinese strategic culture and unrestricted warfare. The Chinese strategic culture is an ambiguous one. On the one hand, China prefers a pacifist approach using, for example, soft power and diplomacy to other instruments available to the state to deal with issues. Its involvement in regional and international organizations being a manifestation of this approach. On the other hand, it will use force legitimately and without hesitation to defend its sovereignty or territorial integrity despite a preference to means other than war to be seen as a player in the international arena. Citation Eric Queller, no, Quellet, and Pierre Pahlavi, Research on Political Military Wargaming for Irregular Warfare. Red Actors Studies Report, Toronto Defense Research and Development Canada, Center of Operational Research and Analysis 2011, 3, which I means either uh, volume 3 or page 3. I'm going to go with volume 3 there. Anyway, returning to the text. It will, however, do so in a pragmatic way after having exhausted all non-violent alternatives and assessing the cost of using force against a foe. Confrontation must be done at the moment that guarantees victory, and if a retreat is required, it is not a failure, but rather a circuitous route to follow towards victory. Citation Niquet, Culture strate uh, Stratégique et Politique de Défense en Chine. So again, that's either a French or possibly Italian publication. I'm going to go with French more likely than not. Anyway, uh, returning to the text itself here. The Chinese strategic culture makes a full use of all military and non-military means available to the state while seeking an enemy's weak points through a circuitous route strategy and using asymmetric warfare at the time of their choosing. All of this is done by using strategic combinations as outlined in unrestricted warfare. Beijing will use supranational combinations by reaching out to regional and international organizations to seek legitimacy and seek help to deal with emergent threats while saving on national resources that can be dedicated to supporting its growth. 
supra-domain combinations will bring various means to different planes of operations as it follows circuitous routes to achieve its objectives. In addition, supra-means combinations will also seek economy of resources and maximize their effect. Finally, supra-tier combinations will break down the time factor in that means and combinations will be performed at a time of China's choosing. I'm going to reread that because that didn't make a lot of sense, that sentence. In addition, supra-means combinations will also seek economies of scale to maximize their effect. That's what that should say. Finally, supra-tier combinations will break down the time factor in that means and actions will be performed at a time of China's choosing. That makes sense. This serves to achieve surprise or ensure that the conditions are in place to ensure victory. It could be tempting to argue the concept of unrestricted warfare is a self-fulfilling prophecy since it emanates from the culture that ultimately led to its creation. However, the way it harnesses what was valid centuries ago to a contemporary application reflects well on China's strategic culture and shows that using unrestricted warfare as the basis of comparison between the Chinese and Iranian foreign policies is pertinent. New section heading here at the base of page 13. Genesis of the Iranian foreign policy. How they see themselves. Iranians consider their ancient history as one of the greatest uh, as as one of greatness less for the 150 years preceding the 1979 revolution which they qualify of national of national humiliation and intervention by foreign powers. Citation Glenn E Curtis, Erich J Huglund and Library of Congress Federal Research Division Iran. A Country Study, Washington, D.C., Library of Congress, Federal Research Division, 2008, XXXIX, which would be um, 31, subsection 10, I think, if I probably might, or maybe 300 and, 300 and, uh, 310? No, no, 311. I'm going to go with... Yeah, so three X's in a row would be 10, 20, 30, plus I would be 31, and then another 10, so 31 times 10, 310. That's probably what that is. I might be wrong. Um, anyway, returning to the text itself here. Um, Iranians consider their ancient history as one of greatness, less for the 150 years preceding the 1979 revolution, which they qualify as a time of national humiliation and intervention by foreign powers. They also consider themselves as the sole country apt to determine its destiny and as the only one which can exert influence beyond its borders thanks to its long historical presence in the region under the concept of Iran Zamin. Citation Raymond A. Hinebush, uh, Hinebuzush, or something, I don't know, the German name, I think? Hinebush, Hinebuzush or Hine's Bush, let's go with that, and Anushira, and Anushir Avan Etes Shami, the foreign policies of Middle Eastern states, Boulder, Colorado, Lynn Reiner, Publishers, 2002, page 286. Consequently, Tehran brands itself as the only regional power capable of ensuring peace and stability in its region and as the standard bearer of Shia Islam. Thinking it has what it takes to become a hegemon in the Persian Gulf, the war against Iraq was, however, a mirror where they saw their weakness and the importance of possessing a, quote, strong army, more specifically a nuclear capability. Citation, Felipe de, uh, Dumas, Iranian Foreign Policy Since 2001, Alone in the World. Thomas Juno et Sam Raziv, uh, Razavi, 2013, New York City, New York State. 
Rutledge Publishers uh, 232P, which would be page number, uh, and then they have something here in, I think that's Spanish, Etudes Internationales, 45, number 3, 2014-50. So my interpretation of that would be it's the foreign language international press edition of the article, but it's in Spanish, and uh, article number 3 of the publication year 2014 and page 50 of said thing, if I'm not mistaken. Either way, uh, returning to the primary text here. Iranian self-perception is double-sided. On the one hand, it outlines the importance of survival for Iranians, perception of being victimized in brackets here, since they were invaded throughout their history. Foreign interference and infringing on its sovereignty have left a negative mark on the Iranian psyche. Citation Hinezbush and Etrahashami, the foreign policies of Middle Eastern states. It actually says Middle East states. Uh, page 285. Returning now to the text up above. Um, Iranian self-perception is double-sided. On the one hand, it outlines the importance of survival for Iranians since they were invaded throughout their history. Foreign interference and infringing on its sovereignty have left a negative mark on the Iranian psyche. On the other hand, they give themselves a sense of importance which stems from their imperial past. Citation, Now and Olapali, Worldviews of Aspiring Powers, Domestic Foreign Policy Debates in China, India, Iran, Japan, and Russia, page 120. On the other hand, they give themselves a sense of importance which stems from their imperial past, while being determined to be recognized as a regional power and an unavoidable regional actor. Through adversity and the, this duality, Iranians draw the motivation and will to put the Islamic Republic where it belongs, with the big players of the region and the related recognition of being as such by the international community. How they see the world. <clears throat> Pardon me. New heading, How they see the world. With the United States and their allies' presence in the Persian Gulf, Iranians see their environment constraining and oppressing the Islamic Republic. They are concerned the Americans, through regional and international influence, are preventing Tehran from being at the table of discussions on the regional security construct. Iran sees the Middle East as its own area of influence and views its interests as are best served when no other entity is infringing upon it. Unsurprisingly, Tehran interprets the presence of foreign military and naval forces across the region as an existential threat. Notwithstanding these concerns related to physical borders, Iran does see beyond the fortress with the pan-Shiism mindframe. The Muslim world is a battlefield for its ambitions. Citation Pierre Pahlavi, the place of Shi'ism in Iranian general uh, in Iranian grand strategy, Defense Nationale et Sécurité Collective, uh, 64, number 8/9, August through September 2008, year 2008/56. Uh, so that's Pierre Pahlavi, the place of Shia Islam in Iranian grand strategy. Um, Defense National Security Collectivism something, which would be like, I guess, a um, academic journal on military affairs in the region. Um, volume 64, number uh, edition 8 out of 9 for that year and for that uh, volume number. Uh, for the year and time frame of August through September 2008, and then page 56 of that. That's what I believe that says. While the U.S. presence in the region may not be welcome, Tehran did make strategic gains following U.S. invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan with the disappearance of Saddam Hussein and the weakening of the Taliban regime. Iranians also saw an opportunity in the U.S. entanglement in Iraq. 
leading former president Ahmadinejad to reach out to Saudi Arabia to exploit a power vacuum following U.S. departure from Iraq. Citation Frederick M. Vahari et al., dangerous but not omnipotent, exploring the reach and limitations of Iranian power in the Middle East, uh, volume MG781, Santa Monica, California, RAND, which would be RAND Corporation, 2009, page 12. Furthermore, the Iranian nuclear deal with the P5 plus 1 had the effect of many sanctions being lifted, which in turn favored greater diplomatic and economic relations with Western states. As it looks to the east and the BRICS, uh, British, uh, sorry, BRICS, so that would be Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. That's the name of the international organization, which is an acronym. As it looks to the east and the BRICS, it sees a counterbalance to the west. Russia and China, as permanent members of the UN Security Council, can serve as an effective counterweight to U.S. and uh, to U.S to United States and their allies while they can initiate economic links with emerging markets. New heading. How to act. Survival. Three elements guide Iran's actions. Survival, projection of power, and a drive towards regional diplomacy. Although Tehran viewed its foreign policy through an ideological prism following the revolution, their survival was at risk. Khomeini, or Khomeini, issued a fatwa in 1989 which claimed the state had precedence over Islamic regulations in the interest of Iran's defense, for which we have the citation Emilian Kavalsky, The New Central Asia, The Regional Impact of International Actors, Singapore, World Scientific, 2010, page 217. Nausen. Um, where was I? Ah, yes, yes, yes. The Islamic Republic showed the signs of a trans-Westphalian state, which Ouellette and Pahlavi described as being rooted in history, acknowledging modernity despite being defined in a pre-modern past and seeing this approach as a way to ensure their survival through the adoption of Westphalian forms of legitimacy, at least on their surface. Citation Hulet and Parvi, Research on Political, Military Wargaming for Irregular Warfare, Red Actors Studies Report, uh, 17. Thus, similar to Deng's foreign policy reform after the Maoist era, Iran adopted a pragmatic approach where the raison d'etre overcomes religious principles evo uh, evocated by the revolution, a means to an end instead of an end unto itself. Iran also secured its survival through an expansion of its diplomacy beyond the Persian Gulf, seeking global actor status. Citation, uh, Pierre Pahlavi, La vraie uh, nature du pouvoir iranien, Politique internationale était 2008, uh, section 194. So that in English would be uh, Pierre Pallavi, uh, the natural pouvoir of the Iranian, uh, International Politics Journal, uh, year 2008, I think, is roughly what that would translate to. Uh, continuing now, where was I here? Uh, just a moment, un momente. Uh, where was I? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Iran also secured its survival through an expansion of its diplomacy beyond the Persian Gulf, seeking global actor status and leveraging its visibility within the region to support and legitimize its claim as standard bearer of Shia Islam by exploiting common ethnic and religious affinities with the people of the region. It did so by combining its diplomacy and religion into one. Projections of power. 
As Iran claims its place in the Persian Gulf region and beyond as the only regional power capable of ensuring peace and stability, it faces its neighbors and their common ally, the United States of America, which has shown its capability to alter a region's power equilibrium. The Islamic Republic did not rebuild its conventional forces after the war with Iraq to an antebellum level. Citation Anthony H. Uh, Cordesman and Martin Kleiber, <coughs> Iran's military forces and war fighting capabilities, the threat in the northern Gulf, Westport, Connecticut, Prager Security International, 2007, page 20. Interesting report there. It realized its survival rested with asymmetric warfare and developed various ways of using military resources through state and non-state proxies to avoid head-on conflict against a more powerful enemy. This is reflected in the Mosaic Defense Doctrine, which provides Tehran with a forward defense to keep its enemies outside the Islamic Republic through, quote, hybrid warfare, conventional and non-conventional, or irregular forces and means of waging war, reflecting the actual capabilities of Iran's military forces. Citation D.W. Smith and Canadian Forces College, Iran, an examination of the Mosaic defense in a conflict with the West. Canadian Forces College, 2013, page 4. As the Americans implemented their policy of containment in the region, Iranians countered with a strategic policy of deterrence. One, asymmetric low-intensity war inside and outside the country. Two, modernization of Iran's weapons systems. Three, developing indigenous missile and anti-missile systems, and four, their nuclear program. Citation, Mohosan M. Milani, Tehran's Take, Foreign Affairs, 2009, pages 49 through 51. So Foreign Affairs would probably be a journal there of some kind. All right, um, returning to the text. It also complements its military power with the use of information, <coughs> showing resolve to domestic as well as international audiences and nurturing doubt about its actual precise capabilities. In addition, Tehran determined that its influence could be projected through participation in international organizations such as Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Economic Cooperation Organization, and as one of the founding countries of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC. The recent nuclear deal also provides Tehran with an opportunity to use its positive image to further the projection of its influence by demonstrating goodwill. Drive Towards Regional Supremacy Tehran engaged the international relations arena beyond its region to grow its international status and to acquire the full status of an actual power. Therefore, Iranian leaders are busy building a grand strategy, pardon me, a grand strategic alliance that Tehran is presently lacking. Citation Pahlavi, the place of Shi'ism or Shia Islam in Iranian grand strategy, page 58. All right, son. Um, let's see, where was I? Oh, fuck. Um, yes, Tehran engaged the international relations arena beyond its, regional, uh, beyond its region to grow its international status and to acquire the full status of an actual power. Therefore, Iranian leaders are busily building a grand strategic alliance that Tehran is presently lacking. <coughs> Above and beyond linking with international organizations, Iran also wants a relationship with countries which presently share the same anti-U.S. feeling, or perhaps anti-American sentiments would be more accurate. Citation Ibid, page 58. Therefore, allowing Tehran to shape and influence these organizations without U.S. containment, all the while serving its strategic interests. New heading. Iranian strategic culture and unrestricted warfare. 
The drivers of Iranian foreign policy are mainly its sense of victimhood and perpetual distrust with a feeling of strategic importance in the region. While their past history has taught them to be careful and prepare for any eventualities while being wary of others' true intentions, a feeling of Iranian strategic self-importance for the region and its religious brethren exists. In addition, a revolutionary aura is maintained to counter the victim sentiment while seeking international recognition of Iran's strategic self-importance. It seeks peace and stability, either by choice or to adopt an acceptable quote-unquote social behavior among nations, while supporting groups whose role is to wreak havoc, appearing on the surface as working against what Tehran wishes for in the first place. To the outside observer, making sense of this is arduous since Iranians are, quote, masters in the art of cultivating ambivalence and blurring lines. Citation, a country in search of might, the mark, news and perspective, last modified May 2009, and this is followed by a fairly lengthy uh, section of URL here. Something, something, the mark, news, a country in search of might. Anyway... Uh, returning now to the text. Um, by using all the means available to it... Oh, sorry, not wrong spot. Pardon me. Um, yes. To the outside observer, making sense of this is arduous since Iranians are masters of the art of cultivating ambivalence and blurring lines. And in analyzing them, we have a compartmentalized vision of their strategic thinking while, in fact, they consider many factors at once. The key to this enigma may not be how they operate, but rather how we look at them, i.e., we should be looking at the forest instead of looking at individual trees. By using all the means available to it, Tehran practices a multifaceted policy, citation Ibid, to drive its foreign policy. Whether it is religion, oil and political diplomacy, the nuclear variable, its soft power and propaganda, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps and its proxies, all means are used and integrated. Iran's ability to switch between pan-Shiism and pan-Islamism, in addition to be a joker card usable in a wide array of settings and purposes, also takes down actual geographic boundaries, citation Pahlavi, the pace of Shia Islam or Shiism in Iranian Grand Strategy, page 57, and opens up different domains on which Iran can cooperate either in, sorry, can operate either in isolation or in combinations. I'm going to reread this paragraph from the top because the length of those citations made it somewhat unwieldy. Unwieldy. By using all the means available to it, Tehran practices a multifaceted policy to drive its foreign policy. Whether it is religion, oil and political diplomacy, the nuclear variable, its soft power and propaganda, or the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps and its proxies, all means are used and integrated. Iran's ability to switch between pan-Shiism and pan-Islamism, in addition to being a joker card usable in a wide array of settings and purposes, also takes down actual geographic boundaries and opens up different domains on which Iran can operate either in isolation or in combinations with other states or non-state actors. Related to this multifaceted policy, Iran's military doctrine keeps in mind its strengths and weaknesses and considers how to approach a stronger opponent. As Iran opts for a deterrence model of attritional warfare, uh, citation Iran's military doctrine, United States Institute for Peace, accessed March 8, 2016, with a uh, link below. Anyway, returning to the text. Um... Related to this multifaceted policy, Iran's military doctrine keeps in mind its strengths and weaknesses and considers how to approach a stronger opponent. As Iran opts for a deterrence model of attritional warfare, asymmetric warfare is the answer to the situation. 
Focusing on its strengths while also looking for an opponent's weaknesses, Iran increases the risk for the opponent. When considering the complex web of roots composing Iran's strategic culture, they lead to principles of unrestricted warfare. It is at that point that we see the forest instead of the individual trees and that we get a glimpse of the actual logic and wisdom hiding behind Tehran's actions. As unrestricted warfare is followed by Iranians, it also provides an observer a key to breaking the code of Tehran's thought processes. The Red Dragon and the Phoenix Common and Similar Factors While Beijing calls upon its supreme role in the region, and Tehran brands itself as the sole country apt to determine its regional destiny, they both share a victim narrative. Their views of the world are also similar. China sees that foreign powers are out to constrain its rise and prefers a multipolar world order, keeping a close eye on Washington and leaning towards multilateralism as a tool and tactic. The Islamic Republic also keeps an eye out for Washington, similarly feeling constrained in its environment and in its attempts to expand its regional influence and improve its image as a powerful state. It also discovers the benefits of multilateralism in terms of gaining allies and support. Beijing focuses on its economy while reassuring its neighbors, countering constraints, and looking after diversifying its resources and sources of natural resources. Tehran looks into surviving, projecting its power, and establishing a regional supremacy. They both require security in order to ensure proper resources are allocated to their survival and growth. While seeking to expand their web of influence through diplomacy and improvement in regional and international organizations. The Red Dragon's economy grows, while the Phoenixes should soon be reaping the benefits of the nuclear deal in the P5 plus 1. Again, in hindsight, that didn't really pan out. Either way, continuing here. Strategic Culture and Unrestricted Warfare As China prefers to adopt a peaceful approach to foreign policy problem solving, it will not hesitate to use force, but not without a careful pragmatic consideration of the cost on resources. It will also make use of various means in numerous combinations, including circuitous routes, and act at the time of its own choosing to have the best chances of victory. In Iran's case, seeking peace and stability will be the way to follow from a pragmatic perspective, mainly to regain a positive public perception, while using all the resources available to the state also in a myriad of combinations following a multifaceted policy. In addition, China and Iran both use irregular warfare as part of the foreign policy and security policies of their nations. Characterized as trans-Westphalian states by Ouellette and Pahlavi, China and Iran can be respectively seen as, quote, soft big players and, quote, wannabe big players. Citation, Ouellette and Pahlavi, Research on Political, Military Wargaming for Irregular Warfare, Red Actors Studies Report, pages 17 and 18. The, quote, soft big player enjoys external legitimacy, sought to gain influence and power, and avoids direct confrontation with potential foes while also not seeking violence as a means to achieve its end goals and seeks out legitimacy. Citation, Ibid, page 18. In summation, it keeps a 360-degree field of vision and uses all means available on, unto it onto a long-term horizon, irregular warfare providing all the flexibility it requires. Again, citation in bid page 18. 
the wannabe big player enjoys less external legitimacy and less resources, which can bring it to be more confrontational, although it will not necessarily use violence. Aware that this could hurt its legitimacy among the audiences where it cultivates grievance is upon which it will draw some sort of legitimacy. Citation Abid, page 18. This player will also make use of all means available to it while maintaining a 360-degree consideration of how to use them, although it operates on a medium horizon with irregular warfare being a tool to impose itself faster. Citation Ibid, page 18. My, they're citing from that text quite a lot. And Ibid in this context is Ulet and Pahlavi, research on political military wargaming for irregular warfare, Red Actor Studies Report, pages 17 and 18. Let me remind you. All right, now, continuing from where we were just a moment ago, we finished off with the sentence, this player will also make use of all means available to it while maintaining a 360-degree view of consideration of how to use them, although it operates on a medium horizon, with irregular warfare being a tool to impose itself faster. Again, citation Abid 72. Sorry, Abid um, page 18, which was notation 72 of this uh, paper. So what? The Iranian foreign policy follows the same logic as the Chinese's by adopting a pragmatic approach and fully using available means in various combinations and quote-unquote battlefields. This is exemplified in Iran's multifaceted strategy as it moves its resources around while seeking a stronger enemy's weak points. For an outside observer, this may look like a disjointed way of conducting a foreign policy. It gets easier to understand when one looks deeper and sees the webs between the means and the various domains where they are exploited. In consequence, as Iran is affected by similar factors to China, and as like China it follows, it follows the precepts denoted in unrestricted warfare, we can deduce that the Iranian foreign policy is positioned to follow the same logic as the Chinese's in that it will make a full use of all means and resources available to the state while following a pragmatic approach in their use and taking into consideration the means available to the state. While China is taking its sweet time, Iran wants to catch up. Hence a more aggressive, pardon me, hence a more aggressive approach. But as Iran's foreign policy matures and its basis of legitimacy and economic strength grows in the wake of the nuclear deal, Tehran is likely to continue its ascension and follow a developmental pattern similar to China's. Conclusion while this essay made a comparison between two countries' foreign policy considerations, it only scratches the surface of what constitutes two countries already linked by oil and international politics. As they both have intricate and rich histories, they share similar, despite different, cultural heritages. They both want to become major players in their respective regions. They do not seek to become hegemons and make territorial gains, at least not for now in China's case, and are both determined to become involved in regional organizations in a way that the United States of America will not be able to interfere either directly or through their allies and proxies. While some may criticize unrestricted warfare for its lack of novelty and make it appear as nothing more than a recollection of warfare principles already outlined by great warfare thinkers like Sun Tzu, it, is still, it still delivers a powerful message about the importance of keeping a 360-degree vision to ensure the use of all resources, battlefields, and means to manage foreign and security policies. 
It means not thinking in a linear fashion by marking items on a to-do list. Unrestricted warfare tells us that in today's fast-paced and perpetually changing environment, those who can't have the cognitive ability to master or at least consider these aspects shall be bound for failure. China and Iran seem to be following some of these precepts while making steps to adapt and overcome the challenges and changing situations today's politics and security environment bring to us. A potential follow-up on the research would be to consider the moment at which China and Iran started to move towards principles of unrestricted warfare and compare this timeline not only to the United States but to the West in general and to consider where some of our weaknesses may be. So this concludes on page 24 the paper that was written by this particular gentleman on behalf of the Canadian um, military college or something to that effect. There is, of course, the bibliography, which I shall read subsequently right now. So beginning here on page 25. Bibliography. Alvandi Rodham, or Roham, Nixon, Kissinger, and the Shah, The Origins of Iranian Primacy in the Persian Gulf, Diplom uh, Diplomatic History um, Journal, probably, um, volume 36, number 2 of 2012, pages 337 through 372. Next here, Bijan, no, Bijan Zeng, China's Peaceful Rise to Great Power Status, 2005. Brant Philippa, The BRICS Bank and China's Growing Web of Developmental Financing, Development Financing, accessed April 25th, 2016, and there's a link below that, which we will not be reading aloud. Why should Australia join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? Accessed April 25th, 2016, followed by the link to that document. Breslin Sean, Handbook of China's International Relations, New York, Rutledge, 2010. Connell Mitchell, Iran's Military Doctrine, United States Institute for Peace, accessed March 8, 2016, and the link following that. Connolly, Chris, and Jorn Karsten Gottwald, The Long Quest for an International Order with Chinese Characteristics, A Cultural Perspective on Modern China's Foreign Policies, Pacific Focus, uh, again, probably Academic Journal, Volume 28, Number 2 of the Year 2013, pages 269 through 293. Curtis Glenn E., Erich J. Hoogland, and the Library of Congress, Federal Research Division, Iran, A Country Study, Washington, D.C., Library of Congress, Federal Research Division, 2008. Deng Yong and Fei Lin Wang, China Rising, Power and Motivation in Chinese Foreign Policy, Lanham, Rowan, and Littlefield Publishers, 2005. Dreyer June Teufel, Chinese Defense and Foreign Policy, New York, Professors World Peace Academy, 1989. Feng Huiyun, Chinese Strategic Culture and Foreign Policy Decision Making, Confucianism, Leadership and War, New York, Rutledge, 2007. Goldstein or Goldstein, Stephen M., Yunnan and the Great Powers. The Origins of Chinese Communist Foreign Policy, 1944 to 1946, Volume 1, The Association for Asian Studies Incorporated, 1981. Yan'an and the Great Powers, The Origins of Chinese Communist Foreign Policy, 1944 to 46, by James Reardon Anderson, New York, Columbia University Press, 1980. X216 PP, which would be page 216, Maps, Notes, Bibliography Index, uh, $15. I don't know why they say that. The Journal of Asian Studies, number 41. Uh, no, the Journal of Asian Studies, 41, number 1, 1981, pages 120 through 121. <clears throat> 
Hayton Bill, The South China Sea, The Struggle for Power in Asia, London, Yale University Press, 2014. Now to page 26. Um, just a moment here. Holmes Colleen K. What the Chinese Learned from Sun Tzu, U.S. Army War College, 2000. Hussein Zadel Ismail, Iran's Open Door Economic Policy, Receipt for Indebtedness, Deindustrialization and Dependency. Center for Research on Globalization, accessed April 12th, 2016, with a link following that. Hunter Shireen, Iran's Foreign Policy in the Post-Soviet Era, Resisting the New International Order, Santa Barbara, California, Prager University Press, probably, or just Prager, uh, 2010. Horowitz, J.C., The Persian Gulf, After Iran's Revolution, Volume Number, 244, New York Foreign Policy Association, 1979, Jeffrey W. Bolander, The Dragon's New Claws, Volume 85, Quantico Marine Corps Association, 2001, The Dragon's New Claws, Volume 85, Quantico Marine Corps Association, 2001, yet again, uh, Kara Hassan H., the New Silk Road Diplomacy, China's Central Asian Foreign Policy Since the Cold War, Vancouver, interesting, University of British Columbia or UBC Press, 2009, uh, Kavalsky Amilan, The New Central Asia, The Regional Impact of International Actors, Singapore, World Scientific, 2010. Lampton David M., the Making of Chinese Foreign and Security Policy in the Era of Reform, 1978-2000, to 2000, Stanford, California, Stanford University Press, 2001, Lang Tang, Lang Tijne, Mark, Chinese Foreign Policy, An Introduction, Milton Park, Abingdon, Oxen, Rutledge, 2013, Maloney, Suzanne, and United States Institute of Peace, Iran's Long March, Iran as a Pivotal State in the Muslim World, Washington, D.C., United States Institute for Peace, 2008. Madieros Evan S., Project Air Force, United States and RAND Corporation, China's International Behavior, Activism, Opportunism, and Diversification, Volume MG850, Santa Monica, California, RAND Corporation, 2009. Milani Mohosen, or Mohsen, M. Tehran take, Tehran's Take, Foreign Affairs, 88, Number 4, 2009. Mingjiang Li and Nanyang Technology Universe, uh, Technological University, S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Security in the South China Sea, China's Balancing Act and New Regional Dynamics, Volume Number 149, Singapore S. Rajat Naram School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University, 2008. Morris M. Mortal, uh, The Islamic Republic of Iran, The Genesis of Its Foreign Policy Since 1979, American Diplomacy, 2015, Volume 1. Now Henry R. and Deepa Mary Olapali, World Views of Aspiring Powers, Domestic Foreign Policy Debates in China, India, Iran, Japan, and Russia, Oxford, Oxford University Press, 2012. Niket Valerai, or Valerie, Cultural Stratégique et Politique de Défense en Chine, Maison de la Chimie, Paris, Institut Francais des Relations Internationales, September 26 through 28, 2007 and 2008. Hulette Erich and Pierre Pachlevy, Research on Political and Military Wargaming for Irregular Warfare. Red Actors Studies Report, Toronto Defense Research and Development Canada, Center of Operational Research and Analysis, 2011. Pachlevy, Pierre, A Country in Search of Might, The Mark, News and Perspective, with a link below that that we shall skip. Guerre irregulaire et analysis institutionnelle, le cas de la stratégie institutionnelle des gardiens de la révolution et Iran, en Iran, 
Etudes Internationales, Volume 42, Number 4, 2011, pages 473 through 492. Next, the place of Shi'ism or Shia Islam in Iranian grand strategy, Defense Nationale et Sécurité Collective, Vol uh, 64, number 8-9, August through September 2008, published again 2008. La vraie nature du pouvoir iranien, Politique Internationale, number 120, uh, published 2008. Kiao Liang and Xiang Sui Wang, Unrestricted Warfare, China's Master Plan to Destroy America, Panama City, Panama, Pan American Publishing Agency, published 2002. P.K. Ramanz Ramazani, Ramazani, Independence Without Freedom, Iran's Foreign Policy, U.S. University of Virginia Press, 2013. Raquel Eva Patricia, Iranian Foreign Policy Since the Iranian Islamic Revolution, 1979 to 2006. Perspectives on Global Development and Technology 6, Numbers 1 through 3, published 2007, pages 159 and 187. Iranian Foreign Policy Since the Iranian Islamic Revolution, pages 19, uh, published 1979 through 2006. Uh, Perspectives on Global Development and Technology 6, Numbers 1 through 3, published 2007, covers pages 159 through 187. Ramazani Ruhola Ru K, The Persian Gulf, Iran's Role, Charlottesville University Press of Virginia, 1972. Reifer Flanagan, Barbara Ann, Islamic Real Politique, Two-Level Iranian Foreign Policy, International Journal of World Peace, 26, number 4, published 2009, covering pages 7 through 35. Robinson P.S. and Canadian Forces College, China and the South China Sea Debate, Crouching Tiger or Hidden Dragon, Canadian Forces College, 2013. Sadri Hausman A., An Islamic Perspective on Non-Alignment, Iranian Foreign Policy in Theory and Practice, Journal of Third World Studies, 16, number 2, published 1999, and they say here page 29. Smith D.W. and Canadian Forces College, Iran, an examination of the mosaic defense in a conflict with the West, Canadian Forces College, 2013. Spence Jonathan M. A. M. Uh, Arden Wolf, Ashley Tellis, Homi uh, uh, Kad Karas, and Minxin Pei, China Rising. How the Asian Colossus is Changing Our World. Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, accessed April 11th, 2016, and the link to the PDF below that. Van Massel, Major John A., Unrestricted Warfare, A Chinese Doctrine for Future Warfare. Masters of Operational Studies, United States Marine Corps, School of Advanced War Fighting. Marine Corps University, published 2005. Van Ness, Peter, Revolution and Chinese Foreign Policy, Peking's Support for Wars of, natu of National Liberation, Berkeley, California, University of California Press, 1970. Varnar Maik, Iranian Foreign Policy During Ahmadinejad, Ideology and Actions, New York, New York, Palgrave Macmillan, 2013. Vehri Frederick M. Project Air Force U.S. Rand Corporation Incorporated, Books uh, 24 by 7, and United States Air Force, Dangerous but Not Omnipotent, Exploring the Reach and Limitations of Iranian Power in the Middle East, Volume MG781, Santa Monica, California, Rand Corporation, published 2009. Wilson Dick, Zhao, uh, Zhou Enlai and the Foundations of Chinese Foreign Policy, Xiao Kuo Kang, Basing Stoke Macmillan, 1996, uh, XII, which would be 12, page 12, I believe, 
plus 370 pp. So that would be that's a very odd formatted citation here. I'm guessing that means chapter 12, page 370. And they say 33 British pounds for some reason, followed by the number sequence 0-333-68029-4 in quotations there. And then finally, the China Quarterly 151, so it would be volume 151, published 1997, pages 668 through 669. Wu Guogang and Helen Lansdowne, China Turns to Multilateralism, Foreign Policy and Regional Security, Volume 24, Milton Park, Abingdon, Oxen, Rutledge, 2007. Zhao Sui Sheng, Chinese Foreign Policy, Pragmatism and Strategic Behavior, Armonk, New York, M.E., I don't know what M.E. would stand for there, Sharp, 2004. So that concludes the um, citations section for this academic paper coming out of the Canadian Forces College on the subject of unrestricted warfare, the um, text written by those two previously mentioned, I believe they were army colonels of the Chinese People's Liberation Army, Qiao Liang and Wang Xiang Sui. And that particular docu document, originally published in February of 1999, will be listed in this same playlist on YouTube as basically a follow-up chapter, effectively. Consider this your introduction, so to speak. Anyway, I'm finishing up this recording Monday, April 15th, 2019, at 10.52 p.m. Signing off, Alfie Zane. Thank you for joining us, and have a wonderful evening.